taking a chance on love. I thought that cards were a frame up, but I never, never, never would try. Now I'm taking the game up. Thank you very much for downloading this featured content podcast. It is episode three. Barry Lee Martin has joined us once again here in the studio for Solihull Radio. We're listening to a little bit of Mel Torme, taking a chance on love, and we are going to be hearing all about Barry's life and life story as he's flown back from Vegas, if you've listened to episode two. And uh, we're going we're gonna to pick it up there. Barry, how are Hi. you? Good morning. Hello, everybody. Thank you for listening. It's great yeah. being with you, Jeff. No problems. You're more than welcome to uh, come in. Now, if you'd listened to episode two, uh, you would have realised that Barry has been out in Vegas for the last three months. Um, and we had a bit of a hiccup there, didn't we? Because it got to the stage where they couldn't pay you for the work that you were doing out in the clubs, in, uh, on the strip, mm-hmm. effectively. So, yeah. so what happened? What was the catalyst that brought you back to the UK? Uh, well, two, two major things, really. Um, what brought it really to my attention was when uh, I landed at um, uh, Las Vegas Airport, uh, it was the first time I, I've obviously been to Las Vegas. I didn't realise how massive it was because in the airport there are loads of slot machines, hundreds, and wherever you go, the slot machines. And then, remember, I uh, was taken by the taxi driver, and I, I got to the uh, largest piano bar in Las Vegas. Well, funny enough, the gentleman that actually owned that largest piano bar in Las Vegas also owned all of the slots in the airport. And I, I'd been singing there for about a week or so, and the gentleman actually came to visit the bar, and he came and heard me, and he liked me, and... Um, he actually said to keep me, mm. basically. Mm. But because uh, they were under a lot of uh, supervision of some sort, I don't know. This is only the story that I'm told, that the FBI are everywhere mm-hmm. and that they fed me, basically. Right. So really, I, I not only sang, I don't know whether I mentioned this because I can't remember everything I said last time, but I not only sang there in the evening when I wasn't working with Pierre Marini, uh, but also with a lady called Stacy at lunchtime. She covered two or three hours in the lunchtime, and I, I actually would sing there as well then because I just like singing, don't I? Yeah, of course. So if anyone asked, you, were, you weren't you were receiving any financial recompense no. for the work that you were yeah. doing, but suddenly you had board and lodging, yes. and uh, you had a little bit of safety and security with uh, all the people that you'd been working with. Yes. Uh, but... How then did it change for you to suddenly go, well, hold on a second, this is not working? Um, The the thing is, the trouble was it was working. But I'd arranged with my wife that, um, you know, we talked about money coming in to her while I was away Mm because I didn't know how long I was going to be away or whether I'd be back next week. Sure. Because who knew what was going to happen? So I'd taken a fixed amount of money. I uh, got my return ticket just to be sure. And so when I first uh, went to my first, uh, my second lodgings, actually, which was a lovely lady called Tess, um, she'd been in the catering and uh, restaurant business all her life. Um, She'd had a hard life, you can tell it in her face, but she was a very, very lovely woman. Um, But I was just one of five of her guests. She had other reps Mm -hmm. staying there. Uh, They were on full board. I was just on, (laughs) just just or, bed. Uh, just bed, yeah. A room and a roof. A room, really. Lovely and clean and very pleasant. And um, I will just uh, get over this bit. And um, anyway, I, I'd be coming home, I don't know, two or three o'clock in the morning and then spark out and then breakfast was being made by the other, for the others. Oh, yeah, I remember. And, the, <laughs> and, if, and the smells were there and yeah, you were yeah. thinking, crumbs, I, I could do with a bit of that. Yeah. So you, you got to there. Yeah. And then I stayed there till, till yeah, yeah. I left. And then you, you, the money was running out. Yeah, but something, but something else happens actually. Um, it's a picture. I didn't have a picture of it, but I, I can see as I talk to you now, I can see myself crossing over the road to go to the Sahara. Hmm. And on t- don't forget, the Sahara probably might not be there now because they must have spent billions, trillions. Uh, you know, they've knocked most of it down. But the point is, is that above um, the uh, Sahara Hotel was a clock tower, a square clock tower, with the time and the temperature. Yeah. So this is midnight. I'm crossing the road, 
and it's 99 degrees wow. at midnight. But wait a minute, it was hotter still down here on the ground because, you know, Vegas never sleeps. Yeah. The cars at midnight were still nose to tail. So you got the exhaust, the heat from the cars. You yeah. had to get inside to get the air conditioning. Yeah. And that was one of the things that was wearing me out. I started to become quite tired. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I can remember my wife wanting to send me money yeah. uh, to, just to keep me there because I got there and I'm getting somewhere. I'm singing, particularly at the uh, Flamingo Hilton, one of the most prestigious hotels. I'm in the middle lounge. Who knows what's going to happen next? So the, the whole point of staying there is like really being here and busking outside. It's exposure. Hmm. You don't know who's in the audience yeah. uh, and so on. And people were very good to me and were working for me, if you like, because they got me on that stage. Sure. Well, but, they saw the potential. Please, God, yeah. Um, but uh, it came to the end that I really had to go back. Okay. So I can remember the day before singing. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, I was in the um, in the bar. Yeah. And I can uh, here in Las Vegas, folks are so friendly. They say, Barry, don't go home. And there's bits more to that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, in a way. And my wife was quite right, but I, I think I'd come to the end of what I felt I could do there. Sure. So I came back, as you said, you land, but there's a big problem. Um, there's one, one is a problem, and, and one is uh, something that I will tell you in a few minutes about. The problem is, I have been away for three months plus. Yeah. So nobody was there to uh, they The agents got fed up of ringing because I'm not there. Sure. I'm not able to give them any dates. So all of a sudden, you really have got nothing. But that didn't take long to pick up. Uh, but uh, shall I go back and perhaps I mentioned to Jeff, because I have no script. I- I've got a little prompt in front of me this yeah, morning. Yeah, sure. Um, chronologically, uh, as to uh, what happened. Remember, Jeff reminded everybody that I'd got a shop and I was still singing. And I was still singing. So I'll put the good bit first because a lady was talking to me over a coffee uh, a year or so ago and um, a lot of this, what we've been talking about, has come out. And so she said to me, but but wait a minute, you've done this, you've done that. There's some things you folks haven't heard of yet, but uh, why why isn't it you weren't discovered? Well, the thing is, I actually was discovered. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go to my prompt now because yeah, I'm not too I, sure I can of see all the you. names. Uh, yeah, I can see you looking at uh, the list. Well, it's, it's most important, actually. Um, I, uh, I had a funny weekend this weekend. I, my, my old car gone kaput, so I got another new old car from a lovely chap in Solihull. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the Thursday, Friday, Saturday in the morning, it wouldn't start. Oh, I got a big gig in Nottingham called Nottingham Boot and Shoe. It's amazing how all these names come back, you know. I'm only 33 and, you know, the names just come floating. <laughs> yeah, it's very clever. <laughs> and um, so I, I uh, rang him up. He comes straight down. He told me there was uh, some part needed sorting out in the engine. So what he did was he took the car engine to pieces and put it bit by bit as he took it apart up my drive. Right. But he couldn't stay to put it back. Oh. Okay, so I'm a pram and toy man. I'm very good at repairs. That's yeah. no problem. And I actually did put it back, and it worked first time. Wow. So next morning, Sunday morning, I'm off down the motorway towards Nottingham, and it's rather strange, isn't it? You're driving along nice and peaceably, and all of a sudden, the police car attaches itself to you. You, yes. you know it's you he wants. Yeah, <laughs> so, and he's just biding his time. He just happens to be right behind yeah. me. So they pull me over, ask me to get out the car and a uh, driving license. And I have to inform you, Mr. Marcus, that this car has been reported stolen. Wow. So I said, well, I can't be. I went to the guy's house. What's he got to hide? And this, that, and this. So they must have kept me half an hour, 40 minutes when they found out, yes, it was stolen, but it was returned. But somebody in the police department hadn't told them. 
Okay. So I said, well, thank you very much. I'm going to be late for my gig now. I've got a big club. It's a very, very big club called Not- Nottingham Boot and Shoe. The policeman says, do you know where it is? I said, I've no idea. He said, well, follow me. And the police took me straight to the club. Wow. With the blue lights like, and oh, everything. Es- police escort. I'm, yeah, I must tell everybody, you can't see my hands are everywhere. Yeah. In delight. Yeah. So I go uh, onto this club, and it's an old theatre. Right. Uh, there was many hundred people there. Nothing boot and shoes very, very good. You know, that that's what they're known for anyway. So I'm halfway through my act, and then I hear this noise coming down the centre aisle. There's a guy who's very drunk singing my song. So he floats all the way down and doing, the, and doing his, what I was singing. And then the next thing you know, three security guys, security guys grab him. Right. Well, I wasn't happy with that. So I said to the guys behind me, just play till ready and, you know, and then yeah, I'll come yeah. back vamp, to you. So, vamp over that, yeah. Yeah, that's the normal thing when you want to yep. sort of have a moment. So I went down and got, got hold of the guy and said, he's doing no harm. He's singing my song. What? Remember, we've talked about this before. What comes into your head? I don't know, because there's nothing in your head at all. You just, the guy do no harm. And we're having a bit of fun, really. Sure. Yeah. So I took him back on stage. And we sat down with our legs over the front of the stage. And we finished the song together. It... <sighs> take a breath. Yeah. It <laughs> literally, mm. yeah, literally take a brought breath. Brought the house down. Brilliant. I, I couldn't do anything wrong then, could I? No, not at all. So you sung a nursery rhyme and they would have clapped I, you. I'm telling you, <laughs> <laughs> for us to walk backwards, they would have done as yeah. well. But um, so it, it went down a storm, actually. So I get back to the shop in Sheldon on Monday morning and the girls are telling me that there's somebody called London Management have rung me up and they want me to ring them back. Right. So I said, I said no, it, no, come on. It can't be London Management because, you know, they're the biggest... Uh, agents in Europe. If Sinatra or anybody else came out, they'd all go through London management and an elderly gentleman, we all knew him because it was part of the business, it was yeah. Billy Marsh. They were based in Regent Street. So I tell them, oh, must be one of the guys in the club playing up or something. Yeah. But it took them till Thursday to make me ring and find out that there's a guy called Gary Morecambe that wants me to come down to London and sing for London Management. Apparently, they had an agent in the audience. Uh, they liked everything that went on. And, and you know, you, you, uh, I've started now, if I may sort of just pat myself on the back just a little. I'm no longer really a singer. Uh, I love people. Um, I've become an entertainer mm. more than a singer. So, you know, um, I'm doing a, uh, if, I'm doing, if I'm doing my own cabaret spot, I'm doing a 45-minute time spot, which takes an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes, sometimes two hours, because something's going on in the audience. I'm making things go. And people are, if they're enjoying you, then they react to you. And so it goes on from there. Well, my, I, I spoke to Gary, and he said, if you come down to London, see if you can get something in London and we'll come and listen to you. We want you to audition for us. My brother Gerald actually lived in London and he knew the owner of a nightclub in Piccadilly called Aphrodite's. It's a supper club, mostly Americans. So he arranged me to have 20 minutes uh, one, e- one evening. So I went down in this particular afternoon for the bank hall. Uh, the bank hall went very, very well. A young guy then came over to me and told me he's the percussionist for the band. He's, right. he's not sitting in that night, but I like your set. Uh, can I sit in? I mean, to have a percussionist sitting there with you. It's That'd brilliant. be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. So there I go. My, my heart certainly isn't in my body. It's floating around, being crushed by all the red buses outside. It was just pounding away. And the two directors are sitting over here with my brother and his wife having some dinner. And it's a very, very small... Parquet flooring, dance floor, right, uh, with a small wall with wrought iron all the way around. So when I'm singing, the nearest table to me is about two f- two feet away. Wow, so that's intimate. That's it, an intimate, really, yeah, uh, really lovely. But yeah. you know, I I wasn't quite enjoying it just yet, was I? Oh yeah, you know. Um, anyway, so uh, I have a, a an old song that I used to sing, which seems to do well today. It's called "Lady Is a Tramp." Yeah. 
So I'm saying, she gets too hungry for dinner at eight. This American lady, about six inches away from me, shouts out, can I get you a doggy bag, honey? The place erupted. Wow. The band fell apart. The people couldn't stop laughing. And me, my nerves just flew away. Wow. And everything went fantastic. So we spoke afterwards because everything was so good. And Gary said, I want you to come down to London, meet Billy Marsh, Mm -hmm. which I did Mm. Uh, about a week or two later. And um, if I wanted to make an inquiry uh, to speak to London management, I could ring them and speak either directly to Gary Morecambe or would you believe it to Billy Marsh himself. The telephone people would put me through. I was right high, high up. Uh, I was really, I'd just been discovered. Mm. F- forget Simon Cowell and the X Factor. I'd gone past that already. Yeah. And uh, so um, I'm sitting across the desk with Billy Moss sitting just right there. And we talked about things. And then he pressed a button, called his PA lady, a tall, um, a dark lady. And we're going to take Barry on, just take his particulars and things like that. And uh, we said our goodbyes, and I went down into Regent Street and found my wife. I was, um, I don't know uh, whether what's above the stratosphere, but I was somewhere up there. And, you know, this has happened uh, to little old me. Wow. And, and at the time, Billy Marsh was the entertainment scene, wasn't he? He was... He biggest. was the go. He was the biggest one. The biggest. London management, from my memory, oh yes, is is people like uh, Morecambe and Wise. Yes, the, these are the. This yes. is the sort of level. Correct. Um, and uh, yeah, Billy Marsh Associates, which f- came out of London management, and, Correct. and you think, wow. So you're now in, yeah, and your particulars are taken. They've taken some headshots, and where did it lead? Uh, well, I didn't hear anything for a week or so, so right. I, I sort of just left it for a week or two, something like that. Mm. And I rang, I'd spoken before in, in between time, and as I said, if I want to speak to Billy Marsh, the girl on the switch put me straight through. Mm-hmm. No problem at all. I really was in seventh heaven. Um, the shops were doing well as well, so m- my wife was there, my brother was there, and so on and so forth. And... Um, then about two or three weeks later, I want to speak to Gary Morecambe, and the lady on the switchboard told me he's left. That's it. No more. Than mm. He's left. Can I speak to Mr. Marsh? No, he's busy at the moment. So I, I really don't know what happened there at all. Uh, but what it appears to me, whether there was some, something wrong at, at head office, that whoever Gary was involved with yeah. uh, was tainted. Right. Let's put it. I, I couldn't think of anything else. I know uh, I then didn't sing for quite a while afterwards. I didn't want anything to do with this dirty business because <laughs> yeah. I was now 300 feet down below. That's forget. right. Your confidence you know, was I've not. I've been straight up there. Yeah. I didn't want to know anymore. Hmm. What I should have done, which everybody tells me afterwards, should have gone on the train and gone straight down to London management. But it doesn't work like that. You don't want to speak to anybody about it. You don't want anything to do with it at mm-hmm. all. So then we come to uh, a a major thing that happened. Um, I didn't have one shop anymore. I had three. One uh, in the Swan at Yardley on the main Coventry Road and a brand new big shop, uh, a double fronted shop at Chelmsley Wood uh, in the main shopping centre and it was opened by the Queen. Uh, Yes, I I actually was at lunch with the Queen. Wow. No, I will still speak to you, Jeff. Yeah, yeah I was going to no, say, no, no, uh, no, if no. I can uh, yes. make an appointment to see you, Barry, <laughs> that'd be great. So the, uh, the, the Queen came along, she opened the shop, and this is still in the same retail area, isn't it? It's prams, oh. it's um, yes. ch- child, uh, children's wear. Children's wear, toys, yeah. and, and stuff like that. Okay. And it was a big shop. It was uh, double-fronted, 160 foot long. Wow. was the shop downstairs in the basement. It was long, as 185 foot. Uh, so it was a big shop, but we were doing very well. Yeah. Then something uh, happened that, I mean, these are statistics. I, I'm a Virgo, and um, mm-hmm. um, normally, don't look at the car, normally a tidy man. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> statistics are very, very important when you're stocking 400 prams and you're running three shops with 15 people. It's important that you have finger on the button, have my brother working on the account side, had a super guy who worked for me for several years. He did all my stock for me. We had an amazing 
uh, stock system. And um, all of a sudden, the babies stopped coming. This is 1976, 75, 76. So I find out that January, February, March, or March, February, March, and April mm-hmm. were the highest birth rate months of the year, and there were no babies, or very, very little. So all of a sudden, the pram and toy industry went into implosion. Mm. Um, we lost everything. Three shops, uh, a brand new, well, we've been living in the house, a four-bedroom house in Knoll, brand new car, whatever it was. And um, the reason seemed to be, uh, when I looked up uh, the statistics of it all, is that we were um, living in um, more and more blocks of flats and things like this. So the prams, people that disappeared were Royal, Marmot, Tansad, Pedigree, the only people that really of any note that lasted and are still here today is Silver Cross. Mm. They're the only big ones. But they obviously uh, were affected by this. And then what actually happened is a huge amount of imports came in with super folding prams. Uh, Anyway, I'd lost my business. And um, we moved into a house in Yardley, uh, which we rented through a friend of ours. And um, I, I really carried on singing. Uh, and I actually took um, uh, this job I mentioned uh, about the wholesale ladies. Uh, we were sitting at home one night when uh, Alan and Irving, two great pals of mine from uh, cricket and football, through the same club, we've known each other for a lot of years, uh, came in, uh, marched through the door, I'd left the front door open. and You could in those days. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> But um, then they recruited me to come and help them out. And then I worked with them, I said, in, in episode one, and then that led to Las Vegas because yeah, yeah. I was seeing I more you. and more. So back I came and I started to uh, sing again. Mm-hmm. And um, I was, I think I might have mentioned this slightly. So I I was starting to get back on my feet again, and the confidence was coming back again. I was going to say, how did it, take yourself back to that time when you knew that you'd lost mm-hmm. effectively a, a lovely house in Knoll, everything, the car that you just signed yourself up for, um, <coughs> three shops, and not only that, the understanding that you were employing fifteen people in yeah. the local community. Yeah. How did that? Effect, how, how did that send you into what we would now know as depression, or did you were you able to <laughs> fight it? Um, the the answer is yes. Um, it's a very depressive because you've you forgot to mention one thing, Jeff. What was that? Well, I got two boys and a wife. Oh, uh, of course, yeah. And and the the the, the dynamic in the family, you, was your wife supportive? Oh. And, uh, Absolutely. She really was a, a wonderful woman. Um, we divorced uh, about 10 years later. Right. I, I think going back, you know, Jeff, you've made me think an awful lot uh, about various different things, even though I, obviously I've talked about this a mm. lot. And uh, the two boys um, uh, both live in uh, Sully Hall in Monk's Path. Right. Um, um, the, the younger one, the older one's never got married. Uh, the the younger one, uh, well, I have a grandson. He has a oh, fantastic okay. voice. Wow. Uh, really, he's 11. His dad, my son, also has a fantastic voice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's something that I keep going back to, the choir and Anya, but the point is it's, it's very much part of my life. So I've talked to um, Darren and, and Max that we should all join <coughs> the same choir together. Max should, has a voice that, again, is not broken, he's 11, should be singing in the cathedral choir. He sings in Italian as well, just to give you an idea. Wow. He has an amazing voice. Uh, but I, I haven't suggested it to Anya yet because I'm sure she'd want to emigrate. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Having to deal with three Marcuses <laughs> three, all in one go. Three in the that's same. That's too much. In Don't the same push gig. Me. Yeah, yeah, in the exactly. same gig. So, so you, you, you've, got, you've got past this and you've worked yeah. out you know how, what to do next and you've been given some opportunities yeah. from from your people and your I confidence got a job. you you got a job and you bounced back I did back. get a job a very good job and then suddenly 
you're mixing a little bit of what's going on there with a little bit of performing just to keep your yes. confidence level going. Yes. And moving towards the end of this particular episode now, yes. w- we're in Yardley. Yes. Where do we go? Um, well, I, I did this, uh, I started to do all various different things. And I, I'm, I'm, I think I, 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 it's very difficult to talk about yourself, isn't it, really? Oh, it is, incredibly, yeah. So I'm doing a lot better again, and I, the entertainer's coming back. Good. And then um, I did a, a gig for um, a large club, and apparently I was recommended to another very big agency, one, one of the biggest in the country. Um, uh, it was Nottingham, uh, a Nottingham agent, and they booked me for four weeks to sing in Malta mm-hmm. at uh, Corinthia Palace Hotel, which is five star. It's in the middle of the island uh, by where all the diplomats are. There's a new one on the outskirts of Valletta in Malta, which I only saw just a few months ago. But I was four weeks there, and that's very, very unusual because don't forget when you have a hotel and a holiday uh, island, Sometimes folks are there for two and three weeks at a time. Yeah, sure. So I'm the cabaret for the hotel now. So I've got my own big spot. Um, it generally went on for about an hour and a half, hour and three quarters. Wow. I got five great guys at the back of me. They were absolutely right behind me, everything I did. Um, so they must have heard something good because you don't, you're singing to the same people sometimes. Um, but the people themselves make a different audience. They, I'm sure the most comedians will tell you, don't tell the same, expect the same reaction every night to the same joke because you've got a different audience. Mm. And that's what would happen. And I was very lucky because um, 30 uh, German um, travel agents came and stayed at the hotel looking around the island. Mm-hmm. They were there for 10 nights. They came and saw me every single night. They were the, the backbone, if you like, of my audience. They were great. So I was there uh, for four weeks, and um, I was there for the four weeks before the uh, week before Christmas when they changed their program. Sure. Uh, this was, a, again, a very big supper club, but they had a, a huge ballroom, um, and sort of in the theater as well. And I was very, very lucky because uh, people from three corporates um, chose... Um, the f- uh, chose me the cabaret yeah. and the band of course I won't go anywhere yeah yeah no they're, once they're you've brilliant. got a good band yeah, you, they were good. you, you, you yeah. make them follow you oh no we, yeah. were, we were quite a crew together excellent and um, including the Ford Motor Company so we we earned big bucks as well and the nice. band went with me but I will tell you one little thing yeah because uh, it's never happened before um, halfway through my act I used to have a lovely chrome and black stool yeah, and I used to do a Tom Jones number. I had a suit to match, by the way, which was pretty indecent, actually. Uh, but one of those things that you do when you're in, <laughs> yeah. when you're in front of an audience. Was there Barry? Was there a ruffled shirt? Um, could have been, but, uh, but I got better than that. I even uh, had two dinner suits, yeah. and I had a white jacket as well. Nice. So for the big corporates, I even wore a white jacket. And you you do look good, don't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. Really? A white uh, jacket, stage, a white dinner jacket, yeah, is lovely. Was and uh, anyway, so I go, I go down into the audience, you see, but I already know who I'm going to pick because th- the ladies, God bless them, do let you know um, that they don't mind coming up. Let's put it like yeah, that. Yeah, sure. So I go, but they must be with a man. Yeah. Uh, you know, they have to have a partner because I asked the gentleman first, mm-hmm. is it okay? And um, so the gentleman said yes. So I take this lady um, and put her on my stool and I'm singing... Um, I who have nothing. And Effie, who was the keyboard player, oh, so lovely person he was, he's pointing at me as to the husband. And I turn around as I'm doing my number. The husband's wringing his hands like nothing. So we said, I, I who have nothing. And then I cut it straight off. Thank you so much. For coming. Oh, Wow. Um, th- this is an amazing thing that happened. It happened in Las Vegas as well, actually. Uh, God bless them. The ladies uh, are very, very good sometimes. So they whisper their hotel and the hotel room to you while you're singing. Of course they do, yeah. And when I was doing a club um, in Warsaw, if I can just tell this very yeah, quickly. Yeah, yeah, very quickly. I was there for a week. And while I'm singing, a lady's asking me, 
uh, have you got a car? This is why I'm singing to her. I said, yeah. She says, what car have you got? So I said, a blue Datsun. Where is it? This is going while I'm singing. I said, outside the stage door. So she went, and that yeah, was yeah, it. Yeah. You know, the most important thing is, remember, you're working. Sure, professional. I, I professionally. I loved every minute, of course. So it wasn't a job. But you behave yourself. Sure. Uh, and that's it, basically. So I'm on the next night, and I'm telling the story. So I said, the fellow that's got a blue Datsun, because I've got a red Vauxhall. He owes me a yeah, drink. Yeah, boom, boom. <laughs> Excellent, excellent stuff. Listen, um, what an amazing journey we've had in this episode. There's more, yeah. What, just um, to finish, the loss of your business and your shops, that was 1976, 1977. How long did it take you to get back on your feet in terms of the years, just to, just to finish off? What year was that when you were going out to Malta and you were, uh, you were back on your the feet? The 80s. So you've, you've had a, three years of getting back up onto your feet. Yeah. It takes a while, doesn't it? Uh, yes. And, and I did... Um, I had something that happened to me. It, it seemed this p- particular period in life, from the 80s onwards, mm. um, it's been really uh, quite an assault course because I am not a guy that stays on the floor. Okay. So uh, I will tell you one last story. And... Um, but. It seems whenever I get started, I hit another brick wall. So we're in Yardley, and I, I'm looking for a job. And I, I can't remember exactly, but the job um, was to work for a wholesale food company, a non-food company. Right. I, all I remember was it had executive in the title. Oh, so Sign you up. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I go to its uh, Warsaw Woodway. Um, a company called Warner and Mason. Right. They had 27 cash and carriers at the UK. Uh, the chairman was, uh, it was part of the Galher group. So, excuse me. So it was a big group. Yeah, yeah. The, and the chairman was also on the main board. Right. But the chairman was there uh, in our head office. Uh, of course, you don't know. I haven't quite got there yet. But no. But I went for an interview, and there were people there from uh, Asda and Tesco's and things. This is all to food and... Yeah, food and beverage. Uh, and again, um, Hayden, do forgive me, but this is a true story too. So I, I get home this one night after the interview, and the phone goes immediately. I'm still talking to my wife uh, in the kitchen. I've got through to the final interview. So I go to the final interview, and there's this guy from Asda, uh, Kevin, Kelvin, whatever, and, and somebody else. Mm-hmm. And anyway, I get back, and the identical thing happened. As soon as I got in, the phone went, I've got the job. Wow. So let's cut along to the first morning. I get there about 7, 7.30 in the morning, and t- talking to a fellow called David, who was head of this department I was working for. In came uh, a Mr. Godwin. It's amazing all these names come through. Uh, a Mr. Godwin, who was the sales director for the whole company. <clears throat> and he told me, you missed my final meeting, but you got my vote. And we started, I'm trying to go as quickly as I We started talking about toys uh, and stationery and stuff like that. Right. So I started to discuss with him certain things. He says, well, how, were you in that business? So I said, yes, for over 20 years. Did you know so and so? Oh, he said, yes, yeah, I knew him. And I, Did you know Mr. Yes, of course. And he mentioned somebody in Raleigh. There was another big uh, retailer in Prams and Toys. I was just a little bit bigger than him in the Prams, called Mr. McGawley, well-known family firm. And he and I went to Lenton Boulevard in, uh, in Nottingham for a rally and actually um, uh, designed their first Pram they ever made. Mm-hmm. We did it between us. So Mr. Godwin's getting more and more into me, and he turns around. This is after I've been there half an hour. True story, because it's a big story yeah. for me anyway. He turned around and said to David, you know, we're advertising internally for a new buyer for the group, non-food, and I'm speaking to him. Boom. Within 40 minutes, I'm now an executive yeah. uh, with Warren and Mason as a senior group buyer with a multi-million pound budget in toys and stationery. As one of three senior buyers in the whole group, I had nine cash and carriers under me. In, within 45 minutes of walking in that job. That's a true story. To go on, I was very, very successful. I loved the job 
because I had my own office, I had a secretary, and I, I went to every one of my branches. The chairman asked me for a report on uh, each branch. Yeah. It, it was so bad when I got there, I couldn't give it to him. But the point is this, I was there, I was on the job, I could go to Barrow and Furness, down to Bristol, Leicester, it didn't matter, Worcester, it didn't matter, I could just get out my chair, and I just loved that job. It's one of the best jobs uh, I've ever had. But again, I hit a brick wall. We and were taken over by bookers, and I was out of a job again. And that's where we'll pick up the next episode, everybody. Barry, thank you for your memories today. It's I appreci- amazing, really. Honestly, Jeff, you're asking so many great questions and the right questions. It's really opening my mind. No problems at all, and I thank, thank you, you for so your time. Much again. Join us again for episode four on Hashtag Live Stories here on Solihull Radio. If you've got somebody that you would like to put up, and, uh, or, or maybe even yourself, come in and have a chat with me. It's just a conversation, isn't it, Barry? It's lovely. So much at home here. Good stuff. Uh, we'll get the beer in a minute. No props. <laughs> Take it easy, everybody. We'll see you again very soon. Pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do-pa-do